Hey everyone, Kurt from Pi here. Welcome to my channel. Those of you who follow my channel know that I fly a Lancer Legacy, an experimental aircraft that happens to fall into two distinct categories of aircraft that my viewers have expressed considerable interest in, the high performance category as well as the complex category. Let me take you quickly through why I fly this aircraft, but to do that, I need to tell you first the story of how I got here. What I'd like to do is take you through a brief history of my flying, from the beginning of my training onward, because it highlights the progression that I followed that opened door after door and helped me step up into more advanced aircraft, slowly and over time. So please indulge me as I take a short trip down memory lane. Before I start though, I wanted to quickly cover the definitions of both high performance and complex. Starting with high performance. If you live in or fly out of the United States, it's simple. A high performance aircraft is one with more than 200 horsepower. If you want to fly one of these aircraft, you'll need ground and flight training in a high performance aircraft or simulator, and ultimately an endorsement on your license. This is a rating. Now other countries have different definitions. Since I fly in both Canada and the United States, I'll use both. If your home airspace uses different definitions, please leave a comment below. In Canada, it's a bit more complicated, but in most cases, high performance boils down to an aircraft with a never exceed speed or VNE of greater than or equal to 250 knots. This works out to about 290 miles an hour. Anything meeting this criteria is a pretty quick GA aircraft. There's quite a bit more detail I'm skipping here and there are links to it in the description, but effectively the Canadian definition raises the bar quite a bit higher and is based on the actual performance numbers of the aircraft, not just its horsepower. Either way, in both countries you need an endorsement or signature in your logbook qualifying you to fly these aircraft. The complex category is a bit more straightforward and although Canada has no strict notion of a complex rating to go with it, I'll cover that in another video, the term is more consistently used among pilots. A complex aircraft has three things flaps that can be raised and lowered, a controllable pitch propeller, the most common type of which is known as a constant speed prop, and retractable landing gear. Flaps are straightforward. These are control surfaces that let pilots temporarily change the shape of the wing to alter its lift and drag characteristics and to provide a more favorable airfoil and performance for takeoff and landing. A controllable pitch propeller allows the pilot to change the angle of attack or twist of the propeller blades. There are a few ways to tell if a plane has a controllable pitch prop, but a good one is to look for a lever with a blue knob right next to the throttle. Being able to control the pitch of the propeller blades lets the pilot set how much work the engine has to do on each revolution, or how much air it bites, and it gives the pilot much more control over the performance of the aircraft. This brings us to retractable landing gear. If you think about it, you only need wheels for the ground part of your flight, the takeoff and landing. Getting the wheels and landing gear out of the windstream tucked away into the wings or fuselage removes one of the largest and most obvious sources of unnecessary drag during the cruise portion, which of course is really the part where we care the most about drag. So there it is. Quick overview of high performance and complex. If you have any questions, leave them down below. Let's return to the story. My story starts with the training for my private pilot's license back in the late 90s. In terms of complexity, I got a bit lucky with my first training aircraft, which was a Diamond DA-20 Katana. This was the A1 model. While looking for a diversion from writing my PhD thesis, I was lucky enough to find and join a flight school that was just starting up and using brand new Diamond aircraft. These aircraft were state-of-the-art in training at the time, and along with a Rotax engine, they were equipped with modern avionics, including GPSs and a full IFR panel. More than that, they were shiny, beautiful new aircraft with a pretty good-sized helping of ramp appeal. Although this aircraft was anything but high performance, it gave me a head start in the complexity ladder as it had both flaps and a controllable pitch propeller. In this case, it was a constant speed prop. The beauty of learning power management in your first aircraft is that there is no learning curve. Because it was my first training experience and all that I knew, it became second nature to manage the propeller and power separately, methodically, and by the book. The prop, combined with the small efficient Rotax engine, was the key to this aircraft's overall economy and performance. As I said, it was no speed demon, but managed a respectable 105 knots at efficiencies pretty much unheard of back then, and to this day, 3.8 gallons per hour in cruise. Besides getting me rolling down the complexity path, one other thing that bears mentioning, and which definitely affected my later preferences, was that this lineup of aircraft started my love affair with sleek, efficient performance airplanes. With its glider-inspired heritage, it looked and felt different from other aircraft. When you got into this cockpit, you strapped this plane on, and you felt everything that it felt. It was here that I got my first exposure to how nicely a plane could handle. 
I finished my license but stayed on with the flight club flying katanas for a few more years. I really enjoyed flying them. I used them to build up a bit of time, take my kids for rides, buy them $100 hamburgers, but eventually I found myself starting to get a bit bored with being tied to the flight club. Prices kept going up, there was no availability when I wanted to fly, no overnight trips, and pretty much all the reasons I point out in greater detail in my video on ownership. So I found some local owners of a Cessna 172 that were interested in selling block time in a beautifully maintained 172F. With the 172, the biggest change for me was learning an entirely different handling plane. It is a great plane and very popular for good reasons. They do a little of everything and they can do it well. But I don't think they will ever be accused of feeling light or responsive on the controls or of being a sleek modern aircraft. The transition went fine. But it was really a step down in complexity, as there was no constant speed prop on these aircraft. The checkout was a great experience, and it didn't take too long to get used to the new systems and dramatically different handling qualities of this plane. All in all, I think it took about two and a half hours in the air to get comfortable with the Club's 172. And as soon as I had the checkout on type in my logbook, I began flying the privately owned 172F. While it was a beautiful and well-maintained aircraft, it had only VFR instruments and was neither high performance nor had anything even remotely considered complex in it. What it was, however, was an economical and fantastic aircraft to build time, experience, and explore locally to learn about what I wanted more of in aviation and what I wanted less of. The owners I fell in with were great, and I stayed in this arrangement for nearly 10 years building time and experience, and of course flying more of my family, my friends, and my kids for $100 hamburgers. Beyond that, I took every opportunity to do a bit more training while I could. I completed my night rating in this aircraft, as well as doing a bit more basic IFR training under the hood within it. But with a cruise speed of less than 105 knots, I realized that in order to travel more, greater distances and enjoy flying a bit more, I needed to move faster as well as get into an aircraft with a full IFR panel so I could continue training. Around this time, a colleague of mine decided to buy a Piper Aero, the 200 horsepower variant. With it came a beautiful IFR panel, constant speed prop, and you guessed it, retractable landing gear. I was looking to move on and he was a proud owner of a beautiful new complex aircraft. Of course, this led to some conversation and we talked back and forth for a while before eventually converging on a block time rental arrangement. This aircraft could get me back into a constant speed prop and further up the ante with retractable gear. So at this move, I would enter the world of fully complex aircraft, which was both an exciting and a scary thought. However, I knew it was the right next step for me. With my deep familiarity with 172s, I decided that I would step into the Arrow by first getting checked out in a retractable gear Cessna, preferably something very similar to the 172 that I currently flew. With that decision made, I rekindled the relationship with my flying club and began a checkout on type on the Cutlass 172 retractable gear models. The Cutlass was the perfect intermediate step. It was a 172 in all respects except that it had a constant speed prop and retractable landing gear. The checkout on type on the Cutlass with an instructor was about three and a half hours, most of it in the circuit, raising the gear after takeoff and lowering them back down on the downwind. As everything was similar to what I already had lots of exposure to, the flying and instruction focused on becoming, more than anything else, comfortable with the idea of knowing that if I forgot to put the wheels down, I could destroy a perfectly good airplane. Many consider retracts one of the final pieces of the puzzle to complexity, and I'd agree. Everything about them has to be treated with respect, and few other cockpit-controlled items have such high consequences and disastrous failure modes if pilots let things go wrong. And nothing seems to be more debated within the GA flying community. Pilots are now and will always remain divided on whether they want to fly retracts. The most important thing I learned about transitioning to retracts is to have multiple reminder points during my landing phase. Of course, this includes the final gump check, but I use other opportunities and triggers to remind me to make sure that the gear is showing three greens down and locked. This is a technique I carry to this day. And intercepted, gear going down. Now's a good time for my gump check. So gas, I'm on the fullest tank. Undercarriage, three greens down and locked. Mixture, three green down and locked. After the checkout on type, I flew the Cutlass for about another 15 hours to build a little more time and comfort with the retracks before switching to the Arrow. With the Arrow, I felt like I'd finally arrived. It met all the definitions of complexity, 
and it was also right on the cusp of high performance, just one horsepower shy, but it gave me the taste of what a larger, more performant engine can do. And with the wheels up, it could cruise above 130 knots, the fastest plane I'd yet flown. My checkout in the Arrow was about seven hours of flying from beginning to end. During this time, we did a series of flight reviews over all phases of flight, slow flight, stalls, steep turns, the usual. And I really appreciated this. I was already comfortable with the basic mechanics of retracts and a constant speed prop, but it was a very different plane again from anything that I'd flown in my past. And the checkout let me tie everything together and get comfortable with the entire package from how the aircraft handled to the advanced avionics suite that it had. While learning the new panel, which consisted of Aspen Avionics, a Garmin G5, an autopilot, and a few other advanced features, I finally clued in as to where my flying arc was taking me. I was comfortable with complexity, and in fact, I knew there was no going back. With the Arrow, I had a taste of performance, a fair bit of time on a modern panel, and lots of experience from my past with what I didn't want to do anymore. When it came time to look for my own bird, I knew it was down the lines of what you would call fast cross-country machines, and I document much of this detail in another video. First of all, I found an insurance company and secured insurance. All of my prior experience helped here. The insurance company was very interested in all of the aircraft complexity that I'd flown before, and more importantly, in the retrack time that I had. After finding an excellent instructor and spending just a few days in Oregon, I had my checkout on type. This was a fantastic experience, and at no point did the grin leave my face, even in the first few hours when I felt like I had imposter syndrome in the cockpit. My instructor immediately saw my comfort with complexity in the handling of the aircraft, so we got there in short order. The main thing I hadn't done before were the faster speeds, so focusing on that one thing while flying, increased speeds on takeoff and landing, and a new set of V-speeds to commit to memory. All else felt like it fell into place. And this brings us to today. As I look back, it's clear I had no real plan, and nearly two decades passed before I started shopping for my legacy. But, with a one foot in front of the other mentality, by changing things as I got bored or found other reasons to move on, I slowly climbed a ladder that I didn't quite recognize as being in front of me at the time. By the time I knew where I wanted to go, I had virtually everything in place. I fly a complex, high-performance aircraft, mainly because it helps me achieve my basic mission, travel and exploration. That, and it keeps a smile on my face. Like most things in life, however, us pilots can and maybe should view our progression through aviation as a journey, not a destination. For me personally, every step along the way, every change helped teach me something new, pushed a boundary or two, and later became a stepping stone for something else. This is a great mindset for all pilots to have, whether you fly a Cessna 150 or a TBM always looking for some way to keep improving or some new challenge to step up to. You don't have to do it like I did it by focusing on complexity or high performance, but having gone through it, it was a very well laid out ladder that's just sitting there waiting for you to climb it. Now I want to be very clear. My recommendation is not for everyone to go out and buy a Glass Air 3, an F1 rocket, or a Lance Air Legacy. By definition, these aircraft are not for beginners, low time pilots, or hell, even for the majority of pilots. However, if anything I spoke about today resonated with you, or you are like-minded, you can start down this path. As always, I encourage you to take your time, set a pace that works for you, and work up to them, always staying safe and in control. So I challenge you to think about where you are in your flying career, no matter how early or late, not as the culmination of your piloting skills, but as a starting point. Where will you go next? As you begin chipping away at these other ratings and endorsements, you will become a better pilot and maybe, just maybe, ready for that amazing new opportunity that might come in 5, 10, or even 20 years down the road. It was only by doing this that by the time I figured out what I really wanted to do, I was in the pole position. Am I content with where I am now? Not by a long shot. Each new step reveals a few more in front of it. I haven't even begun to scratch the surface of my shiny new instrument rating, nor experience the joys of turbine engines. But every time I've trained or transitioned, I've been lucky enough to fly with pilots who are better than me, more experienced than me, and more skilled than me. And I'm a better pilot for it. Let's see what you can do. Thanks for watching.